Welcome everyone. My name is Michael and I'm the host for today's webinar. Uh, today we are presenting how turbidity sensors work, principles and practice in water quality monitoring. Uh, today's turbidity webinar is the third part of a six part YSI series that we are running in which we cover various parameters within water quality monitoring. And we are holding the webinars every Tuesday and hope that you will join us for the upcoming presentations on June 9th, which will cover pH and ORP. Uh, June 16th will cover dissolved oxygen and June 23rd will cover conductivity. And if you missed our webinars on anti-fouling and algae, which were held over the past two weeks, we have great news for you. We record all of our webinars and we list them on our Exylum Analytics regional websites. Uh, you can also find registration links for all upcoming webinars on the same site. So how do you find this website? Well, in approximately 30 to 60 minutes after this webinar, you will get an email from GoToWebinar. Be sure to open it because inside you'll find a link to today's recording. You'll also find a link to a certificate verifying that you attended today's webinar. And there will also be a web link to our webinar library from which you can register for upcoming webinars or, as I said, watch recorded webinars. So please keep an eye out for that email coming to you from GoToWebinar after today's presentation. So uh, I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Our VIP, our very important presenter, is Carrie Hubbard. Uh, Carrie holds a Bachelor of Science in Earth and Atmospheric Studies at, uh, from Georgia Institute of Technology. She is the product specialist for YSI in outdoor water quality. And she has over 10 years uh, experience working in the field and assisting with water quantity and quality projects. And for those of you who joined the anti-fouling webinar two weeks ago, you will recognize Carrie because she was one of the guest presenters. And we are very fortunate to have her with us again today. Uh, it's actually 7 a.m. Uh, Tuesday morning for her in the United States. So we're very lucky to have her with us. Now, for those of you who are new to GoToWebinar, um, you know, we'd just like to offer a few tips to help you improve your webinar experience. Uh, at the top of your GoToWebinar interface, you'll find your audio settings. Uh, if you're experiencing audio difficulties, try selecting a different audio device at the top in the pull down in the pick list menu. Uh, in the middle of your interface, you'll find the question box. Everyone is invited to submit a question for the Q&A session, which we'll be holding at the end of today's presentation. So simply type your question into this box at any time during today's presentation. And finally, at the bottom is the chat box. And this is for anyone experiencing technical, de uh, technical difficulties. Again, simply type a message explaining your issue and uh, we'll do our best to support you in the background. Again, if you just can't get the system working, um, please don't panic. Again, we, we are recording this webinar and we'll share the link with you. All right, let's take a quick look at our presentation topics for today. Uh, the first is why monitor for turbidity? Uh, next is evolution of turbidity monitoring principles, how turbidity sensors work, and practice real world monitoring. So uh, before we begin, it's poll time. And I'd like to invite everyone listening to the webinar today to participate in our first poll, which I'm launching now. And on your screen, you should see the question, why do you monitor for turbidity. So how do you use this quick poll system? You simply roll your mouse over the screen, over this quick poll, and just click on the selection you'd like to make. 
So I'll just give you a few seconds to answer the poll. And at this point, uh, while we're waiting for all the answers to come in, I'd like to invite Carrie. Carrie, would you please join us? Hey, Michael, thank you for the uh, the introduction there. And I, I hope that uh, everybody has taken advantage of these webinars for you guys so far and have checked out that anti-fouling and the algae webinar because they were both, you know, personally proud of the anti-following one and I know that it was pretty good but the LG webinar was really good as well so I hope everyone has had a chance to check those out. Great Carrie it looks like we have approximately 60 percent have voted 60 percent or plus. Uh, let's close the poll and share our results. Yeah, it looks like about half of the folks on the webinar right now that answer the questions are looking at water and wastewater treatment for monitoring turbidity. So that's pretty cool. But we got some other folks looking at regulatory compliance and some other folks looking at ecology. And apparently nobody's monitoring turbidity for recreational usage, which is pretty interesting. Great, out okay. here in the States, we do check that out every once in a while. So, <laughs> All right, I'll hide the poll and I'll... I'll let you get started. Awesome, thank you. So we'll start out with uh, the most important question, what exactly is turbidity? So let's start with the fact that it's an optical characteristic. So I've been on plenty of hikes with friends who don't know about turbidity and they'll make comments about how water appears to be clean or dirty based on whether they can see to the bottom of a water body or not. So there's a simple definition then that turbidity is just the clarity of the water. However, if we collected a sample of that water in a cup to show the same friends, they'd be able to see the particles in the water swirling around, leading us to our more complete definition. So turbidity is the cloudiness, opacity, or visual thickness of water due to suspended matter. So I have a couple of pictures on the right side of the screen here showing creeks from my area at base flow and also during a storm event. So in the top image, the water is very clear with little sediment in it, which allows you to see to the bottom of the creek. However, in the image on the bottom, there's so much sand and clay that you can't even see a foot below the surface of the water. So sand and clay are commonly found in my area around the southeast, but there's other common sources of turbidity as well, such as silt, algae, plankton, sewage, and more. This image shows the cloudiness, opacity, or thickness that we described in the earlier slide. On the left here, we have a high turbidity 4000 FNU Formazin standard, and on the right, we have a diluted Formazin standard that now reads 10 FNU. So as we go through these slides, let's keep this image in the back of our mind as we discuss this high and low turbidity values. So on the last slide, I mentioned FNU. So FNU is one of the many turbidity units that can be used when collecting turbidity data. And here on the screen is a list of some of the units that are used. So the units recorded typically depend on the method of measurement used to get a reading. So we'll go in, in a bit further into all of this, but know that we'll focus most of our time and energy on nephilometric turbidity units, which are NTU, and form as a nephilometric units, which is FNU, in this presentation, since those are the most commonly used. So it's important when you're measuring turbidity values that you remain consistent in the use of your units throughout your sampling. You don't want to switch between you know, FNU or NTU or JTU. Uh, you want to be really consistent with your units. Um, and in case you're wondering, the prefix nephilo actually means cloudy. So nephilometry is the measurement of cloudiness. So now that we know what turbidity actually is, what is it not? So turbidity is not a measure of the color of the water. So colors can be introduced to a system by dye studies or from tannins leaching into the water as vegetation in the surrounding area decays. So the image here shows a Blackwater River in South Carolina, which is right near me. So the river is literally black due to the dissolved materials that are in it, but there's very little particulate matter. So at the time that this image was taken, the turbidity was 2.8 FNU, which is very low when we think about that image a couple of slides ago. The water is basically void of particulate matter, but is colored by the tannins. So there are, several, there are several methods of particulate introduction into a system, so we'll briefly make a list and discuss some sources of particulate matter. So first we have storm runoff. As a storm system releases rainfall over an area, particulate matter is picked up from varying sources depending on the landscape. In an urban environment, this may be pollutants or dust or pet waste and more. 
Uh, in a rural environment, the increase is maybe due to loose soil, leaves, and more natural causes. So also as rainfall enters a water body, the velocity is going to increase, which can erode riverbanks, causing an additional influx of sediment. Wind erosion is an interesting source of turbidity, but areas uh, such as the Midwest out here in the U.S., for example, may experience this. In this image here, there are two dust devils that spun up over fields in Minnesota. So these dust devils, along with tornadoes and heavy wind in general, can displace soil from the top of the ground and then suspend it in the air. Since soil has a higher density than air, the soil will eventually drop out and fall to the ground, occasionally landing in a water body like the wetlands shown here. Coastal erosion can be a huge problem for our oceanic friends, so waves naturally stir up sand from the bottom of the ocean and deposit it on the beach, but at the same time they take sand from the beach back out to the ocean. Hurricanes, of course, are very powerful due to the magnitude of wind and water that they bring, and they can strip entire beaches of their sand, which results in increased turbidity in the ocean until the sand redeposits itself one, to way, one way or another. Construction is very common in urban and suburban environments, so as land is cleared for buildings and parking lots, rain events can cause that loose sediment to wash away. Silt fences, like these black fences here, are commonly used to contain the runoff, but they aren't always 100% effective, especially during the largest events. Dredging is the practice of digging sediment out of a channel to increase its depth, and as shipping vessels get larger, channels must get deeper, so dredging vessels must be deployed to fight natural channel sedimentation and ensure safe passage for barges. Sewer discharge is an unfortunate occurrence, but does happen occasionally as infrastructure ages and systems become overwhelmed due to increases in population and use. Animals can also contribute to increases in turbidity, and I've experienced the effects of beavers, like this little fella here, at many of my sites, noting increased turbidity in the nighttime hours as they drag tree limbs through the creek to where they were building their dams. Another animal that can cause increased turbidity is the carp, which is a problem in aquaculture. Carp really like to dig around in the soil, which results in, in sediment being suspended in their ponds. Algae growth can also be a contributor to increased turbidity, especially as blooms grow in size. So Stephanie did a fantastic job explaining algae blooms in her webinar last week, so I won't cover too much of that information here. Go check that webinar out, though, if you'd like to learn more about monitoring for algae. Finally, phytoplankton is the main source of turbidity in the ocean. There's actually a really cool multi-year study on phytoplankton population across the world based on secchi disc readings. So plankton is the source of turbidity. We'll talk about secchi discs in just a moment. So these are just some of the many sources of increased turbidity. I'm sure that you all could come up with a list of a thousand sources, but for now we'll continue on. So there are a lot of reasons that people monitor for turbidity with some of the main reasons listed here. So turbidity is a great indicator of ecosystem health. I know that many of us have heard about fish kills due to low dissolved oxygen values, but high turbidity levels can be one of the reasons for this as excess particles in the water displace oxygen. Sediment also has the ability to clog up fish gills, causing the fish to have issues with respiration. If the levels get too out of hand, animals may also not be able to find each other or their paths to spawning areas, leading to lower reproduction rates. If a heavy sediment load is introduced into typically clean water where fish lay their eggs on the bottom or where shellfish may be located, these eggs and shellfish may also be killed. Measuring turbidity values is also a good way to monitor possible pollutants in a system. Many streams throughout the United States are listed by the EPA as impaired due to bacteria, metals, or sediment. Bacteria and metals, uh, such as lead and zinc, adhere to sediment particles and are then transported through a water system. If a sediment load can be adequately controlled, there's a possibility that the loads of these parameters can also be reduced. Uh, TMDLs, or total maximum daily loads, are targets set for water quality improvement. Uh, one way to improve water quality is to design and build BMPs, or best management practices, like retention ponds. If additional BMPs are developed in a watershed, turbidity measurements would definitely tell a story about how water quality has improved with their construction. Also, people don't like to swim, boat on, or fish in gross-looking water. Some recreational areas monitor turbidity levels to know how their public use may be affected by their water's appearance. Aesthetically appealing water generally means healthier water, and keeping the public from getting ill is very important. 
Finally, turbidity is continually measured during the production of drinking water. So there are standards in place that determine the level of particulate that is allowed in drinking water before it's delivered to the consumer. If the values are too high, adjustments need to be made to the treatment processes and pump systems, which can be very costly. So the image on this slide shows an example from nearly a decade ago about why monitoring for turbidity is important. In this example, the light blue erratic line at the top of the graph is an upstream continuous turbidity monitor, and the smooth light blue line at the bottom of the graph is a downstream turbidity monitor. In, in between these two sensors is a BMP. The data from the upstream site indicates that there was some sort of spill which triggered an alarm for the project to investigate the situation. The BMP that was installed between the sites slowed the sediment transport down, which allowed crews time to deploy to make fixes to the issue before the sediment ever reached the downstream location. The important takeaway here is that through this monitoring, events were able to be seen quickly and time was saved by being able to accurately tell where the issue was and fines were inevitably prevented, all with some simple monitoring. So as I briefly mentioned before, turbidity is a useful parameter uh, when trying to model the load of other parameters. Turbidity can be used as a surrogate for a variety of parameters from bacteria to phosphorus to metals to TSS. In the image here, there is a model that was developed by the United States Geological Survey relating E. coli values to turbidity, discharge, and seasonality. So the solid gray line shows the predicted most probable number, while the light gray shading depicts the error bars on the calculation. So TSS and turbidity are two different things, but they are related, just like I mentioned in the previous slide. TSS stands for total suspended solids. Like the name suggests, it's a measure of the particles that are suspended in a body of water, not those particles that are settled on the bed of the water body. It is typically a value measured in the lab after samples have been collected and is calculated by weighing the dry weight of suspended particles that can be trapped by a filter. These things that can be trapped are sediments, plankton, algae, and decayed material. Dissolved materials are not included in the TSS calculation because they are too small to be trapped by that filter. TSS sources are the same as those we discussed earlier. Anything that causes the turbidity to increase is a source of TSS. So there are a wide variety of reasons that groups monitor TSS with a few of those listed here. TSS can signify a large amount of toxins in the environment because toxins bind to sediment particles and these particles can be transported throughout a system. We can also monitor ecosystem change over time because increasing or decreasing sediment will, will correlate with what may come next, such as effects on animal reproduction or plant photosynthesis. Also, TSS in drinking water may make the water unpalatable, so additional treatment steps may need to be taken to remove the sediment before allowing citizens to consume it. Finally, sediment can reduce the efficiency of drinking water plants by clogging filters, so knowing what the amount of sediment in the water is can help operators to take appropriate actions before harming a plant. TSS is typically measured by collecting samples and bringing them to the lab. This is what we call discrete sampling. However, many groups want to know the TSS value at any time. So this is possible if you're collecting regular samples and also collecting the turbidity values at the same time. We talked about building surrogate relationships with turbidity and other parameters a few slides ago, and that's exactly what we'd be doing here except instead of having to do the calculations in another program, with EXO you can create that regression in our software. So to create a turbidity and TSS equation in core, you would go to the instrument and settings tab, click on the turbidity sensor, and then you populate the chart similarly to what you see here. In the first column, you can enter your turbidity value, and in the second column, you can enter your lab calculated TSS value that corresponds to your turbidity reading. The core software then creates a regression equation, and you can then log continuous TSS on your SOND or transmit that data if you're connected to a data logger. So remember that you do need to continue to collect grab samples to periodically evaluate your regression equation for changes. All right, now that we know why we might be monitoring for turbidity and what it actually is, let's get into the evolution of turbidity monitoring. So there's been many advances in technology over the years, but first uh, let's get this next poll set up to see what types of turbidity technology folks are using right now.
All right, so we've got the poll open. Uh, so what types of equipment are we using to monitor turbidity? Are you guys using a Secchi disc? What about a transparency tube? Maybe a benchtop nephilometer? Uh, that's kind of like the Hawk 2100 if you guys are, are looking at those kind of things. A uh, spectrophotometer? Or are you just using an optical sensor on some sort of sond, whether that's the EXO or, or any other type of sond? Carrie, which do you think would be the most popular answer from our audience today? Uh, well, that's uh, two different answers. We got lab or field. So I think the most popular answer for the field would probably be the optical sensor. But if I had to guess for the lab, I think folks would be using the benchtop nephilometer. Okay, well, let's take a look. Well, I got the optical sensor part, right? Yes, you did. <laughs> So yeah, we looks like we got some folks using the spectrophotometers and you know some folks are are still using the Secchi disc and the transparency tube, which are gonna get you some really good readings. Um that's interesting that nobody is using a benchtop nephilometer right now. Thanks guys for your input. So in this section, we're going to go over tools of the trade used for spot sampling in the lab and for continuous deployments. So the Secchi disk was developed in 1865 by an astronomer named Angelo Secchi. So when he wasn't busy doing cool things like photographing a solar eclipse or mapping channels on Mars, he actually pursued a variety of interests related to meteorology and geology. He developed the Secchi disk to measure the clarity of the water in the Mediterranean Sea after having been hired by the Papal Navy. So the commander of the Navy was interested in learning more about the transparency of the sea and the visibility of the seafloor for navigational purposes. So together they published a paper about their research that led to the creation of the Secchi disk and also described how a boat's shadow, surface light reflection, clearness of the sky, and observer height make differences in getting the most accurate readings. Additional papers were written about the use of the Secchi disk through the 1960s, resulting in the determination that the best use of the Secchi disk is on the side of the boat that keeps the disk in the shade between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. and by the same observer every time. And so something simple just got a tad more complicated. So the Secchi disk is a circular disk with quadrants of black and white as seen in the picture. The quadrants were developed by George Whipple in 1899 for freshwater use. The saltwater version developed by Secchi was solid white. To use the Secchi disc, you simply lower the disc into the water until you can barely see it anymore and then record that distance. The units used when using the Secchi disc are in units of length, whether that is meters, feet, etc. The advantage of using the Secchi disc is that it is low cost, portable, and easy to use and learn. So I mentioned George Whipple as one of the modernizers of the Secchi disk back in 1899. Whipple was a civil engineer specializing in sanitary microbiology and eventually was one of the co-founders of the Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health. Around 1900, he worked with another scientist to develop what would become the first turbidity standard. They developed a standard solution using diatomaceous earth in distilled water to use as a scale and a turbidimeter to go along with it. The, the turbidimeter was a simple flat bottom tube over a lit candle. To use it, you would pour water into the tube until the image of the candle flame underneath the tube disappeared. The height of the water would be compared to the scale developed by, with a diatomaceous earth standard and the result was given in Jackson's turbidity units. As I'm sure you all can imagine, there were a lot of problems with this approach from the accurate composition of the standard to the use of the open flame. However, it was low cost and easy to learn, so it led into our next piece of turbidity monitoring equipment that some of you are using. So the transparency tube is typically a 120 centimeter tall tube with a Secchi disc pattern at the bottom of the tube along with a release valve. The transparency tube is filled to the top with sample water and slowly released using the valve until the Secchi disc is just barely visible. The remaining depth of water is then recorded. The procedure is typically performed at least twice and an average value is what is recorded. 
Transparency to values are recorded in distance units, but there are tables available for conversion with, to NTU. However, there's a caveat that not all of these tables are applicable to your field conditions. So you may have different turbidity sources that scatter light slightly differently than the table. So it's important to verify that your turbidity reading occasionally and plot your turbidity versus transparency tube reading against whatever table you may be using. The turbidity value could be read with either a nephilometer or an optical sensor. So these modern benchtop meters you may be very familiar with. Uh, these are often referred to as nephilometers and units are typically reported in NTU, so nephilometric turbidity units. They actually use a white light to scatter off of the particles in the solution being measured and record the scatter on a detector normally at 90 degrees, but it can be in a variety of angle settings to be discussed momentarily. So to read a sample, an aliquot of sample water has to be transferred to a completely clean cuvette. Completely clean means that there can be no interferences from things like dust or fingerprints on the outside of the cuvette. So always handle the cuvette from the edges at the top when transferring it to or from the meter. The one slight downfall to these meters is, is that they are intended for use with lower turbidity samples. If you would like to use one for higher turbidity readings, you typically need to dilute your sample and then change your units or flag your data to indicate that the value was the result after dilution and then do some multiplication based on your dilution factor to get your turbidity value. These units are typically used in the laboratory environment, like I mentioned earlier, but as technology progresses, they are actually becoming more portable in nature and can be brought out to the field for analysis as soon as the sample is collected. These units are used when following the EPA 180.1 protocol. Uh, the spectrophotometer uses absorbance as its way of calculating a turbidity value, and about 20% of you are actually using these spectrophotometers. So the units reported are absorbance percentage and a regression can be built to correlate turbidity to absorbance. With these units, you must select a specific wavelength that you would like to calculate absorbance at. Different wavelengths of light will result in different values being returned, so it's important to maintain consistency when using these types of instruments. These instruments are also typically used in the lab environment and not out in the field. All right, so now to my very favorite of all the turbidity measurement options that we've seen thus far, and apparently your guys' favorite as well, since 67% of you are using optical sensors of some sort. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at that optical turbidity sensor. So pictured here is one of YSI's optical turbidity sensors for the EXO platform. Many of these turbidity sensors have the ability to record data in FNU and NTU. So FNU and NTU are numerically equivalent based on ISO 7027, and a comparison of the, of the data can be shown in the graph here. These optical sensors have also been developed to read a wide range of turbidity values from 0 to 4,000 FNU or NTU. So if you remember that picture of the flasks at the beginning of the webinar where they went from bright white to clear, these sensors can cover that entire range. These types of sensors have an added advantage that they are extremely portable and are designed not just for grab samples but for continuous deployment. So whether you're wanting to collect data once at a single point or from a single discrete water quality sample, or if you're wanting to deploy a meter continuously to record data every minute or so, these types of sensors will be able to handle the job. These sensors use infrared light to reflect off of the particles and capture the reflected light on a photo detector, most commonly located at a 90 degree angle, but with other detectors possible as well. We'll talk, about, we'll talk more about that in the next section where I'll have plenty of diagrams to show you. So we'll get into the next section now with how turbidity sensors work. And before we get into it, it's time for another pop quiz. So what is the range of turbidity values that you guys measure? Are you measuring up to 10 FNU or NTU, maybe up to 100, up to 1,000, or are you measuring something well over 1,000? So, Carrie, which range do you typically uh, find or uh, do customers share with you? I, I have a wide variety of ranges that customers share with me. So, in some of the urban environments that I've, you know, helped monitor with or monitor myself, we can have base flow values at 2 FNU, and during storm events, the turbidity values will reach over 1,000. Uh, in some of the more... Um, rural areas or in the mountain streams, 
sometimes people only measure up to about 10 FNU. So I've seen a wide variety. Well, it looks like our audience is showing primarily up to 100 FNU. Yeah, yep, but there's a, also a good variety there as well. We've got a little bit of everything, up to 10, 100. About a quarter of the people are going up to 1,000, and 13% of you are going over 1,000. Very interesting. Thank you all. So next we'll talk about a few sensor principles. So the first is going to be the source of light and the angles that the detectors are set at. And next we'll talk about temperature compensation and how the sensors deal with changes. And finally, we'll go over how our YSI turbidity sensors work. So there are two light sources that are commonly used in turbidity measurements. There's a third if you count laser, but we're not gonna cover that here. Just know that is a source for some drinking water measurements. So the first light source is a white light, which is produced by an incandescent uh, tungsten filament light bulb. The light produces a wavelength in the range of 400 to 680 nanometers. The white light method is used when following EPA 180.1 as they describe the need for a tungsten source measuring between the color temperature of 2200 to 3000 degrees Kelvin. If you've never heard of color temperature before, it's a pretty interesting thermodynamic concept, but this temperature range basically puts you in the light spectrum of standard incandescent light bulbs to warm white compact fluorescent light bulbs. The chart on this slide shows the color temperature scale and a source of those temperatures. You can see the tungsten light at approximately equal to 2000 Kelvin. And finally, EPA 180.1 dictates that the detector should have a peak response of 400 to 600 nanometers, which is why most of these sensors emit light in that range. Infrared is the alternate light source option, which is what is used in the XO and DSS. Infrared light is commonly emitted using a bright LED light source. The infrared light source is used when following ISO 7027 guidelines as it states that an infrared source at 860 nanometers wavelength is required. There are also a variety of angles that the detectors can be set at to capture the amount of scatter or absorbance of the light. The transmitted light detector detects all of the light transmitted by a light source with the exception of what is scattered away by particulate matter. The transmitted light detector here is typically used in conjunction with the forward scatter detector, which can be set anywhere from 11 degrees to 30 degrees. These two detectors used in conjunction with one another give a very accurate calculation of low turbidity values. The most common angle that detectors are set at is 90 degrees from the light source. This angle is used because it can encompass the widest range of turbidity values because the angular pattern of scattered intensity is minimized at this point no matter the size of the particle. So I'll discuss this further in the next slide, so hold tight because I know that doesn't make the most sense right now. So the backscatter detector is typically used when turbidity levels are very high because of the decreased path length, which allows them to receive more scattered light than the other sensors. These backscattered detectors should not be used if the turbidity is expected to be less than 1000 FNU. So some sensors only have a single detector to monitor a specific range, and other sensors are designed to have additional detectors to cover a larger range. So 90 degrees is the most typically used light angle uh, in turbidimeters, but why? So as we can see from the images here, light scatter intensity and angular pattern is different dependent on the particle size. Small particles produce a symmetrical peanut-shaped light scatter wave pattern when light is transmitted through a sample. The particle interference is minimized at the 90 degree point. In these other diagrams where the particle sizes referenced are slightly larger, we can see that the scattering intensity greatly increases, but the angular pattern is still very similar. So the scattering intensity is always minimized at the 90 degree angle from the incident light source uh, light beam source. In the image here, we can see how the scattering effects could affect the readings for each photo detector. You can pretty easily tell that at the 90 degree angle, there is less scatter than at the other angles. Also, the longer distance that the light source has to travel, the more accurate the turbidity readings will be at lower levels. The paths to 90 and 180 degrees are the longest, making them the best for low turbidity readings. The path to a backscatter detector, however, is the shortest, which is why it is best for high-level turbidity measurements. 
So turbidity as a unit itself is not compensated for temperature, but yet the instrument uh, is temperature compensated. This is due to the need to correct for temperature effects on the electronics inside the sensor themselves. An uncompensated turbidity sensor in an environment where the turbidity reading is steady but the temperature is changing will show small variations in turbidity values due to those temperature changes. The brightness of the LED in the optical sensor actually will decrease as the temperature increases, which means that as the water gets warmer, the amount of turbidity measured would be less. Thankfully, this is something that is easily corrected for, resulting in data that does not change with temperature. These compensation equations can be computed internally if there is a temperature sensor within the turbidity sensor, or adjustments can be made to the data within the software provided by the instrument or you, you may be using. The YSI sensors calculate the temperature compensation internally. In these images, we can see the turbidity sensor on the Pro DSS and the EXO. The EXO is typically intended for continuous monitoring, but can also be very reliably used for spot sampling, whereas the DSS is intended to be used solely as a spot sampling instrument. The technology in these two instruments is exactly the same, so let's discuss those a little bit more. So the EXO and Pro DSS have the same type of internal components, but just have different external connectors. The EXO has that wet mateable connector and the Pro DSS does not. So the turbidity sensor, like I said, has an internal thermistor to account for changes in that LED intensity dependent on the temperature that we just discussed. Also important to note is the external structure of our turbidity sensor is here. It's made from titanium, which makes it very rugged and durable for all types of your sampling environments. And the circuit board inside the sensor holds the calibration polynomial, quality assurance information, and it also transmits the data from the sensor back to the sond. Inside the sensor, of course, is the LED light source and a photo detector at 90 degrees. There's also a light blocking rib uh, between the LED and the detector to prevent any internally reflected light from reaching the detector. So the YSI turbidity sensor works by transmitting light from an infrared LED here. Uh, through the window on its side of the sensor, the light then hits the particles in the water and portions of the light are reflected back to the sensor. The photo detector here is located at a 90 degree angle from the light source and captures the scattered light that was emitted by the LED. The light blocking rib in the middle uh, ensures that the light produced inside the sensor itself doesn't reach the detector. All right, so we've gone over the history of turbidity and the mechanics of how the sensors work. So before we get into the real world things, let's add in another poll question. So what do you think is the greatest challenge when monitoring for turbidity? Do you think it's calibration or fouling or is it because people are using the wrong equipment or do you think something else is the, the major challenge when monitoring? All right, we'll give it just a couple more seconds. There we go. So it looks like about half of you think that calibration is the biggest challenge, and about a third of you say fouling, and about 20% think the wrong equipment. So thank you for taking the time to answer the question, and the real answer here is that all of these can be a challenge. So hopefully after the previous couple of sections, the wrong equipment won't be a problem anymore. But we'll take a look at the next two now. So in this section, we'll cover proper calibration and fouling prevention. So there are three types of calibration standards that are commonly used when working with any type of optical sensor. They're formazin, stable cal, and polymer. So formazin is typically diluted into lower values and used for calibration. However, an issue with these dilutions is that they don't have a long shelf life. So stable cal is a formazin product that's been formulated to be stable and therefore have a longer shelf life. So it's important to follow the instructions for mixing the stable cal because the formas and particles may settle when the bottle's sitting on the shelf. Polymer standards are the easiest to use as far as mixing and shelf life. These standards are made of microbeads suspended in an aqueous solution. 
So there are three ranges of standards that can be used for turbidity calibration. The first is a zero to one solution. A value of up to one can be input as a standard. So occasionally in low turbidity environments, users will input an offset such as 0.5 as the calibration standard value. This is done so that the user will not see negative values in their turbidity data set. However, if you're seeing negative values in your turbidity data set, there are a few other things to check out before applying an offset to the calibration value, and we'll discuss those in a few slides. The second solution is a 5 to 200 FNU, and the third is 400 to 4200. Uh, it's very important to, that the standards used in the calibrating the turbidity sensor are treated well in the lab, during travel, and in the field. So allowing the standards to freeze or be exposed to high temperatures where evaporation will inside the bottles may occur are going to affect the value that the standard will read. For example, if a polymer standard is stored inside a hot vehicle, the water in the standard will start to evaporate and will not mix back into the solution correctly when the solution is brought back down in temperature. Also, you need to avoid allowing contaminants into the standard solution, especially that zero FNU solution. So I don't know about the pollen that you guys experienced, but down here in the southeast in the spring, uh, pine tree pollen is especially bad. And it's so bad that you can be outside for five minutes and your black muck boots will be completely yellow with that pollen. So you can kind of see in this picture here how crazy the pollen is. Uh, so the addition, so just think of what that amount of pollen is going to do to your open bottle of standards. So that addition of contaminants to your standards will result in an incorrect calibration, and the worst case scenario would be the dreaded negative turbidity value when that sonde is deployed back out in the field. It's imperative that you treat these standards like gold and keep those bottles capped when they're not in use. Also, you want to avoid excessively shaking the standards because bubbles are going to affect your turbidity reading. When you pour the standard, you want to try to pour it down the side of the calibration cup to avoid the, the development of these bubbles as much as possible. If you do see bubbles in the cup and you have a clean wiper brush attached to your central wiper, running a wipe to get rid of bubbles on the face of the sensor is a really good idea. So it's very important to calibrate each of your sensors because there are minor differences between each sensor even upon arrival from the manufacturer. Each sensor is handmade, meaning that there will be minute differences in the placement of LEDs and photo detectors. These differences mean that each sensor will have a different factory calibrated polynomial equation and that the raw values will differ from sensor to sensor. Each sensor is adjusted so that it will read from 0 to 4,000 FNU, but the equation to get those readings will be different. In order to get comparable data from each sensor, a user calibration is, necessarily, is necessary. So let's take a look at the graph here. These examples could be lines directly off of the manufacturing floor after a year of use or after being tossed around in a field vehicle for a few months. The sensors would each show the trend in data, but none would be able to record exactly the same value. The one-point calibration method really should not ever be used unless there really is just a need to correct the zero FNU value. For the low-end calibration, a user could use zero FNU standard, DI water, or something like inorganic blank water. After calibrating each sensor at the zero point, our calibration equations will change to look more like they do in this graph. The lines will match at that zero point, but nowhere else. This data still doesn't match at all above zero, so the single point calibration truly is not enough. The next point used in calibration needs to be between 5 and 200. So common values used are 12.4 and 124 FNU, and calibration standard types could be a diluted formazin, stable cal, or, or a polymer. In our hypothetical example here, we calibrated each sensor at a second point of 124 FNU. We can now see that the values match from 0 to 124, but are still pretty different from 124 to 1,000. For the most reliable calibration over the range of the sensor, adding in the third point to that calibration is ideal. This third point would be somewhere between 400 and 4,000 FNU. If we wanted to measure up to 1,010 FNU, we'd use that as our standard like we did in this example. In the graph now, we can see that after the calibration of each sensor in the 1,010 FNU standard, all of our equations match up to this point. After a full three-point calibration, we could expect that using any of our three sensors in the same environment would result in a similar answer. 
They may still not read the exact same number because again, each sensor is unique and environments may be changing even just a few inches away, but they'll at least be significantly closer to one another than when none of the sensors were calibrated. All right, so after that hefty bit of information right there, I'd like to see what type of calibration you all are doing with whatever equipment you're using. Are you performing a one, two, three, or four point calibration with your equipment? We'll just take a few seconds to get those answers. All right, it looks like most folks are using either a two or three point calibration, so that's pretty fantastic. Thank you all. So calibration of the turbidity sensor is actually pretty straightforward and easy. The trick is to keep the calibration environment as clean as possible. So with that said, step one is to clean the sensor. We'll go over fouling in a few slides, but you really want to get all of that sand, silt, debris, barnacles, or whatever else may be on your sand off of it. If that involves taking all of the sensors off to clean in between them to do it, then do it. Remember, a good calibration is one of the keys to good data, so we want as little contaminant influence as possible. When wiping off the sensor tip, be as gentle but thorough as possible. We recommend using a lint-free cloth to wipe it off, but you can also use something like a magic eraser for those tougher stuck-on stains and messes. Uh, you could use like a Dawn dish soap or, or any other kind of mild detergent to wipe, to, to really clean your sensor off. So the next step in calibrating is the rinse. You'll pour a small aliquot of the standard that you'll be calibrating with into the cup and shake it around vigorously. This shouldn't be an easy shake, but should be something that will get the standard into all those nooks and crannies to rinse out anything that may be left behind, like debris or other standards. We recommend that you rinse three times, but your standard operating procedure may dictate otherwise. So next, you'll fill the calibration cup to between the lines on that cup with calibration standard. You'll then put the sonde into the standard and wait for the readings to stabilize. While the turbidity value is stabilizing, you'll see a red line in the core software or a yellow yield sign if you're using the handheld. You'll be able to enter your standard information at this point, such as serial number and standard type. Once the values are stabilized, you'll see a green line or a green checkmark symbol. Clicking the Accept Calibration button will do just that, and you'll be able to move on to your next standard value, repeating this rinsing and calibration step. Once the calibration is fully completed, you'll be able to finish it and view that calibration report. Now for some tips and tricks. So first and foremost, you want to ensure that your calibration cup is completely clean. So if this means using a separate calibration cup solely for turbidity, then do it. Removing the wiper brush is also a good idea as those bristles can really hold a significant amount of sediment. You may consider installing a new clean brush just during the turbidity calibration. As mentioned previously, turbidity values should never be negative. If you have negative values, this is likely due to a bad calibration. To correct this issue, the first thing that should be completed is a factory calibration reset. Next, before doing your zero standard calibration again, check the standard's cleanliness by looking for any visible particulate or using a benchtop meter to get an actual value. An additional filtering step may need to be completed because not all DI water systems are equal. Also, try not to calibrate in direct sunlight or in too bright of an environment. These additional sources of light can impact the calibration readings. To fight these influences, you can wrap your calibration cup with a towel, put it in a dark environment like a backpack, or wrap the calibration cup in electrical tape like I did in the picture here. So fouling is one of the most fundamental issues of continuous monitoring, costing significant time and money. We're going to go over some fouling prevention techniques here in this section. And again, I'd like to remind you guys to check out that anti-fouling webinar for a lot more tips than I'm going to show here. 
So optical sensors are extremely sensitive to the effects of fouling. The graph here shows another brand of sound that was deployed with inferior anti-fouling capabilities, the red line, as I'm sure you could guess. The blue line is an exo deployed with a strong wiper brush and copper tape. So fouling can be the result of any of number of things, from sediment to algae to microinvertebrates and so on. One fun fouling story from my past actually involved a snake wrapped up in the sawn guard and around and under all those sensors. So I apologize to you snake lovers out there, but when you expect mud and you find yourself face to face with the wild snake, it's not my favorite field day. So I can vouch for the durability of the sawns that YSI makes because that sawn went flying that day and was still in calibration when I finally composed myself and retrieved it from the bushes. I did not find an anaconda either. It was a black rat snake and thankfully that fouling easily removed itself so that I did not have to. So there are several items at our disposal that we can use to try and prevent some of that fouling. So for biofouling problems, we can apply copper components to the sond. These include copper tape, copper wiper brushes, and copper sond guards. When applying copper tape, make sure to apply either a heat shrink sleeve or regular tape first, otherwise the copper tape will not stick to the sensor. Sea spray is a, a Teflon spray that makes it more difficult for particles to stick to the sensors. The spray can be applied to basically the entire sand. And again, remember all of these things I'm talking about here are in the anti-fouling webinar. So sand and sensor heat shrink sleeves and duct tape can be used for easy cleaning. So these wraps cover the sand and sensors and can be cut with a small razor blade and peeled away from the sand. So I'm pretty sure it's, that it's a well-known field fact that all issues in the field can be solved with duct tape. So finally, the central wiper will be the biggest anti-fouling weapon in your arsenal. This wiper has a very strong motor and a stiff bristle brush. This combination allows for the removal of the vast majority of fouling, which is gonna increase your time between visits. It's imperative that the brush is cleaned out during your site visits to maintain its integrity. Occasionally, these will need to be replaced as the bristles splay outward as seen in the picture here. These images show some significant fouling in a variety of environments. So one thing that can be seen in these is how important that central wiper is during continuous deployments. Look at how clean the sensor faces are uh, compared to the surrounding areas of the sand. All of these pictures show what would normally be thought of as worst case scenarios, but good data was still being recorded. The last important piece of the fouling puzzle is the deployment itself. So sons are typically installed in some sort of deployment pipe, whether that's PVC or metal. A vertical deployment is ideal, but that's not always possible. So the important thing to remember is to include enough holes for adequate flow through the sand pipe. Having enough flow will ensure that the environment inside the sand pipe is the same as the environment outside of the pipe. So this means that there should be a way for sediment and other debris to exit the sand. We recommend having several holes alongside the sawn pipe and leaving the bottom of the pipe open with the exception of maybe a bolt to hold that sawn in place. Also, you want to be sure to avoid eddies because these areas are likely not representative of the entire system and sometimes have lower velocities, which will cause the sediment to not properly leave the pipe. Finally, if needed, you can also apply fanti fouling measures to the sawn pipe, such as copper mesh or tape. In the bottom image here, we see a vertically mounted sand pipe in a straight culvert. This sand will have great flow and has adequate depth to cover all the sensors. In the top image here, the depth is too shallow for a traditional vertical deployment, so a horizontal deployment was used, but sediment and water flow were still considered in this deployment, so the ends of the tube are open and ample holes are located along the length of the sand guard. So in conclusion, it's very important that you take your time and have a lot of care throughout the calibration process. Whenever possible, this means avoiding the one-point calibration for these optical sensors and doing the two or three-point calibration. It's important to keep a clean calibration environment and keeping your standards protected as well. As seen in the pictures in the previous slides, Fouling is a huge concern and can cause significant problems on the data. And there are several ways to remedy this situation, but they are definitely not one size fits all. So if your sand stays clean, you'll definitely have better data available for analysis later. A nice clean data set is an easy data set. 
So thank you all so much for attending our webinar today. We got one more poll question from you guys, and that's simply to ask if you would like someone from YSI to contact you regarding turbidity or really anything else. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael now to start off the Q&A session after the poll is done. Gary, thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. And that that story about the snake wrapped around the XO, that, that must have been <laughs> just absolutely terrifying when you when you saw that. It was. <laughs> and, and just out of curiosity, how was the data? Was it still intact? Uh, so unfortunately, I did lose some data from when the snake was wrapped around because he, he was impacting those optical sensors uh, with how he was wrapped in and around the sawing guard. And yeah, this, he was up against the sensor, so I did have to lose some data, which is unfortunate. Yeah, unfortunately, EXO doesn't come equipped with a snake brush. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, sensor, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to close this poll now and bring everybody to the last slide, uh, which is in tune with our question and answer stage of our presentation. Um, Carrie, if I could get you to move to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, just quickly, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to let you know or actually remind you, we've already mentioned this before, about our upcoming webinar next week, uh, which will focus on how pH and ORP sensors work. Again, this is the next part of our six-part series uh, on in uh, YSI's sensor webinar series. It'll be held June 9th. All the webinars are being held on a Tuesday. And you can register, if you haven't already, at our regional website, uh, www.exylum-analytics.asia. Again, this link will be provided to you in a follow-up email that you will find in your email box about approximately 30 to 60 minutes following the closing of this webinar. I realize we have come up to the hour, but we do have some questions that are queued up. And of course, we truly are grateful for your attendance and we want to offer the chance to uh, to answer some of these questions. So, so Carrie, hopefully you can help me out with the answers to some of these. Uh, let's start with uh, a question on linking turbidity monitoring to discrete sampling. Are there best practices for using turbidity as a trigger parameter for automated sampling? Uh, that's that's a really good question. So uh, your turbidity trigger for your auto samplers is going to be dependent on your project. So what are, what exactly are you looking at? Do you want to measure high turbidity samples to go along with your DSS, or are you more interested in base flow? It's it's going to be entirely dependent on what you're trying to look at. There's not exactly a best practice. Um, it's going to be really project dependent. Thank you for that, Carrie. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, what mesh size should we use to filter DI water for calibration? Okay, that is a really good question. So I would tell you to try to use like a 0.45 micron filter. That should be able to, to get most of that debris and everything out of, um, out of your water to give you some, some good DI water to use. But there's a bunch oh. of different filters out there as well. So. <laughs> Sure, I would imagine. Terrific, thank you. Okay, we do have quite a few questions coming in. And just a reminder to the audience, simply use the, the question box on the GoToWebinar interface to type in uh, the question you would like answered. Again, if we don't have time to answer these, have no fear. Uh, Carrie or our regional staff will, simply, will, will certainly uh, follow up with you offline. Uh, okay, on deployment, uh, we live in a country where vandalization and theft are commonplace. Uh, visible mounting almost always ensures theft. Are there any best practices regarding protecting sensors from vandalism? Yeah, there's actually a few different deployment techniques. Um, if you check out that anti-fouling webinar, there's a slide in there that talks about um, how you can actually pump water up from a site and have your your meter actually in an enclosed locked uh, shelter 
um, so you could pump the water from the creek into like a flow cell or into a bucket and collect your data inside a, a protected shelter as opposed to having your sawn directly in the body of water itself. So that could for sure help with vandalism there. Terrific. Okay, let's move on. Um, this question, what is the reading of turbidity that would affect ecology? That's a really good question. Um, and that's, that's really going to depend on what is in your environment. So I'll give you an example from uh, my location. So we have a bunch of trout in the streams out here and trout really like to live in this clean, pristine water. So they really don't like turbidity values above about 10. They like a lot of dissolved oxygen in the water to be able to breathe. And they're very sensitive to the amount of sediment in the water. However, we have a lot of catfish out here as well who they don't really care about the amount of sediment in the water. They hang out at the bottom and eat all the, you know, decaying stuff that's at the bottom of the water. So they can live in, a, in an environment where their turbidity may be a thousand or higher. Uh, so it's, there's not really a, a good answer on what reading of turbidity would affect the ecology because it's going to be dependent on what's in your environment. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Uh, how about the flow of water? Does this affect the turbidity data? So the flow of water can affect your turbidity data if, um, if the flow is causing a substantial amount of aeration that's causing a lot of bubbles to be um, in the sample that you're measuring. So for example, a lot of folks want to measure the turbidity downstream of a dam. And as the water releases from a dam, you know, it's going to really churn that water up and, and cause a lot of bubbles to be in, in the water. So for those kind of situations, if you monitor just a little bit further downstream where the water is a little more flat and even, um, you may not have those, those bubbles in the water that can affect those turbidity readings. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, can turbidity be measured in very clean seawater? Yes. <laughs> I, I that's don't really have a better answer, answer than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that's all they wanted to hear. That's great. Okay. Um, interesting question here, and I hope I get it right. Perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong. In drinking to measure 0 0.5 NTU and below, which one particular light source, IR or tungsten lamp, have better accuracy and should be recommended? Um, so I know out here in the U.S., most of the drinking water plants are going to be following that EPA 180.1 methodology, um, which is going to be using that tungsten light source. So the tungsten light sources are typically better for um, those low-level readings because they're going to be using that, um, that transmitted light source. Let me, let me flip back a few slides really quick because that's a really good question. So the um, transmitted, the infrared ones, are going to be using this detector here, uh, which is going to be good for that really clean water for those really low levels at that 0.5 FNU or NTU, like this um, question is asking. The 90 degree detector, they can measure those low levels, but for drinking water, folks are typically using this transmitted light detector because that's designed for those super clean waters. Terrific, great explanation. Uh, one more question for you now. Uh, it's quite quite broad. How, how do you measure TSS? Okay, so for to collect a TSS sample, you're actually just going to go out to your, your river, stream, lake, whatever, um, and just collect a grab sample. So then you would take that sample back to the lab, and you have to do some filter preparation and that kind of stuff. And then you're basically just going to filter your water sample, collect all the sediment on the top, and measure that sediment uh, and divide it by the amount of water that you, you actually, by the sample water that you actually collected to get a milligrams per liter value. So that would be your, your TSS value. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but there's plenty of procedural documents out there that um, you can check out for additional information. Terrific, thank you so much, Carrie.
Uh, this brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, again, if you do have further questions that you would like to ask, please reach out to us. Uh, we'll definitely follow up with you offline. And our contact information, again, can be found in the follow-up email that will find its way in your email box in about 30 to 60 minutes. Again, we hope to see you on next week. Uh, when we talk about pH and ORP sensors. Carrie, thank you so much for your time and I, I wish you a, a fantastic day. Yeah, thank you guys for your time as well. I appreciate it. Goodbye, everyone. Be safe. Take care. Bye-bye.